Okay, good morning everyone. It's great to see so many people here that I don't know yet. That's a good sign for me, actually. My name is Christian Schwede. I'm a principal software engineer working at Red Hat. And today I want to talk to you about uh, building web applications using OpenStack Swift. So, about 15 years ago, I was asked by a photographer or a small consulting firm um, to make their pictures public available on their website for their customers. And back at that time, it was quite complicated because you had to use all to store all the photos somewhere, you had to build the storage system on your own, and you had to split the photos across multiple servers. It was quite complicated. It was a huge uh, effort that you need to take. And uh, happily today, it's much simpler. Uh, object storage made this much simpler today. And this is what I want to talk to you today about. So let's get started uh, with an introduction, basic introduction into object storage itself, uh, what it is, uh, what's the difference between, well, traditional storages like block or uh, file storages. It's basically a very simple way to talk to your storage system on an application level. That's the difference. Uh, you really talk on an application level to your storage system using a very simple REST API interface. So that basically means you have an HTTP URL for each of your objects, uh, each of your data sets, and can access uh, this data using the HTTP URL. You normally have a very flat namespace also. So in a traditional file system, you have a directory tree with a lot of nested folders, for example. That's not the case for an object storage. So an object storage normally only contains containers, buckets, whatever you name it, which is a collection of uh, a few or more, more than a few uh, objects. But object storage has or makes it possible to scale the whole system very massively. So if you, for example, take a traditional file system, it gets really complicated if you uh, want to go beyond a single node. Uh, you need a distributed file system in that case, and uh, that makes it very complicated. In object storage, as a developer at least, application developer, you know, don't need to think about scaling up your application because the URL stays the same. Uh, you don't need to take care about where you read the data from. Also, most object storages uh, store each object multiple times. So, for example, three times is mostly used uh, within uh, the traditional and uh, public known uh, systems. And there is a cave eat that you need to take uh, into account if you're using an object storage system. It's eventually consistent. So what does it mean? If you store an object uh, on this system, and you do a later on a listing of the container where the object was stored, the container listing might not yet be updated. That happens especially if you have some failures in within your system. And um, object storages are traditionally built around to, to work around these failures. So as a normal user, you don't realize when there's a node down or a disk fails or something similar. Also, object storage storages uh, store the metadata, or you can store metadata along with your objects directly in the system. Um, that's different than your traditional file system, of course. So, for example, if you have a large video file, for example, and you want to store some information like who recorded the video, what's the content of the video, and so on and so forth, you can directly store it within the metadata that is directly assigned to this single object. Videos and other unstructured data is the best use case actually for object storages. So don't use it if you need kind of database-like applications. Um, it's best used uh, for really unstructured data and large uh, data sets, for example, video files, image files, also for backups and other large file sets. So, as a developer or a company, you might be interested in using object storage, so you start looking into um, object storage solutions. And most likely, you start investigating with some public clouds, but that is not for everyone. So your legal or corporate requirements might make it impossible to use a public cloud. For example, if you're storing healthcare data or financial data or other similar things uh, that is not intended for the public, 
it's very likely that you have to store the data within your company and um, be the owner of the data. It also might be too expensive, and that's not only the expense uh, of the storage per month that you need to pay. What really makes the bill bigger is uh, most of the time the bandwidth usage, actually, if you want to read data. So if you have, for example, uh, video files, large video files, and users are downloading them, you always pay for per download, not only for the storage. And of course, you might uh, miss some features on your public clouds. If you, store, if you deploy an own cloud and uh, a private cloud within your company, you have the control over the features that you want to offer your customers, your users, and your developers. So you start using, or you want to use a private cloud. And now, especially with storage systems, it becomes important to avoid the vendor lock-in. Anybody transferred or migrated petabytes of data from one storage system to another storage system in the past? No? Okay, that's good for you. Um, I did this in the past, and it's really, really a tedious process. It creates nightmares for developers, for operators, and so on and so forth. If you have a traditional storage system and you need to upgrade to, for example, or exchange, for example, to a different vendor or storage system, you need to take uh, into account that it takes a lot of time, that you have during the migration two storage systems that you need to support. It's not done within a weekend or so. Um, if you're migrating petabytes of data, so you're normally talking about weeks, if not months or more. So that brings you, hopefully, uh, at least, uh, to OpenStack Swift. With OpenStack Swift and other open source uh, storage systems, you have the full control uh, about the whole stack of your object storage system. So that does mean you have the choice which operating system you want to choose, um, which Swift version you want to choose. And even if you later on decide, I want to use a different operating system from a different vendor, for example, you don't need to migrate all the data that is already stored in your cluster because the data on the disk itself stays there. You just replace the operating system level or maybe the Swift level, but the data on the disk is still there and can be reused afterwards. That makes it also very simple or very nice if you want to upgrade your cluster because you can upgrade your cluster in production, uh, taking a few nodes uh, out of the cluster, upgrade them and later bring them uh, back online later on. And of course you have the full control um, about all the settings that you want to provide within your Swift cluster. For example, where your data is stored, uh, if you for example need a key replication, storing data for example in, in Tokyo site, and uh, another copy of the data, uh, for example, in Paris, uh, you're, you can do that uh, with Swift. Swift is proven in production since a few years. Um, it was originally um, started by Rackspace. I see at least one Rackspace guy here in the audience. And, oh, sorry. And um, it's, uh, I think these guys really pr showed uh, that um, it's, it's possible to run a storage cluster with hundreds of petabytes of size in production for a few more, a few years. So talking about Swift, uh, let's have a short look at the architecture behind Swift. As a developer, application developer, most of the time you're talking to the proxy server. The proxy server is basically the, the entry to the object storage system. And uh, if you want to store an object, you, for example, uh, send a put request, you have an account name, you have a container name, and finally an object name where you want to store the data on. The proxy server then takes your object, and in case of this configuration, where you have three copies of every object, it creates three copies on different disks and different backend storage servers. So even if one of the, or maybe two of these servers or disks are failing, your object is still readable later on. So as you can see, as you can see uh, in this graph, you, you could take out a few nodes, or two nodes in this example, upgrade them, bring them up uh, later again, and uh, during the whole time the users still have access to the already stored uh, objects. What is also important is that, for example, if your disk breaks and you need to replace it, there are some demons running inside the cluster on the storage nodes, for example, object replicators, that ensure that every object is stored three times 
on different locations inside the cluster. If it's not the case, the replicator creates the missing copy from the already existing copies. Sometimes it also happens that you have read errors on your disks, so that are not uh, detected by the disk or by the operating system itself, but um, detected by Swift, by some processes that are running in the background all the time. So there's a process called an auditor and it compares the read data from an object with a previous stored checksum. And if there's a mismatch, it replaces that faulty object with a copy from the existing objects that are hopefully not yet uh, corrupted. If you're running a larger cluster, you see that permanently that you have read errors from the disks that uh, are detected by this mechanism. Most of the functionality that is interesting as, an, as a developer is running on the proxy server. So there are middlewares um, that you can configure to use. The most interesting part is probably authentication middlewares. Um, there are some middlewares that are shipped with Swift, but it's also very easy to write your own authentication middleware if you want to hook up Swift to your existing corporate environment, for example. There are middlewares that are especially targeted at web application or application developers. Uh, it's a temporary URLs and form post middleware. We will come to that in a few minutes again. You have support for quota systems, both on the account and container level. You have object versioning, so if you store an object and later on you want to store an updated version of that object within the same name, Swift keeps both copies and you can later on retrieve whatever version you want uh, from that object. There are also some third-party middlewares, and the most um, prominent one is, I think, the Swift 3 middleware. The Swift 3 middleware makes it possible to use existing applications that use an S3 API together with Swift. That means as an application developer, if you already have an application that talks to S3, it's very likely that you can hook up this application to Swift with no or only a few smaller modifications. You don't need to reinvent the wheel and uh, start working with a whole new API set. It makes it easier to, to migrate to Swift. And then there are some other functionalities built in that are not yet middlewares, but they are more tied into the, into the core code of Swift. For example, expiring object support. I can set a special metadata on an object telling them the object, okay, you are only valid, for example, for one week. And after one week, Swift denies access to that object and deletes it in the background. Important uh, as a web application developer, especially if you're using scripts, so JavaScript for example, is the cross original source sharing. So that makes it uh, possible if you want to run uh, JavaScript on one domain and you have your Swift cluster on a different domain and want to retrieve data. We'll come to that again in a few seconds. So if you want to talk to Swift, uh, you're using the REST API. And um, most of the time, you require, that requires an authentication token. So the authentication token is sent as, a, as an HTTP header. And it's normally the, the, co the content of the token or the token itself comes from your authentication system. For example, Keystone, if you use uh, the one that is shipped with OpenStack. And uh, then you can access all the data on the cluster, hopefully, if the user is allowed to do that. There are only a few basic operations that uh, are needed. It's basically get requests um, if you want to, want to list objects or retrieve objects, head requests if you want to do read metadata, post requests if you want to store new metadata, and put in post to store metadata or actually upload a new object. And of course, you can also delete your objects using a delete operation and copy existing objects to a new name. So if you want to upload data to Swift, there are two ways to do that. Um, the, well, the most uh, prominent one is probably a put operation. If you use a command line client, you are always using the put operation. And um, it, may, it normally requires an authentication token. That's not very useful if you want to so, create a web application. So there is another way to do it. It's with a temporary URL. So you have a specially crafted URL that has a signature appended to it. 
And the signature is then read by Swift and uh, compared uh, to some previously set uh, settings uh, to allow or deny the access to that object. But put operations are only possible if you're using some scripts uh, within your browser, for example, JavaScript. So if you want to use or if you want to build an application that doesn't use uh, JavaScript, for example, that's still the case for some, some, use, uh, for some companies, um, then you need to do that with a HTML form using a post request. So there's a middleware for that. The cave eat here is that you don't know the final object name in advance. So you tell Swift, okay, here comes a form request, uh, HTML form request to this container, maybe with a prefix, but Swift doesn't know yet and your application doesn't know yet what's the final object name. Because your browser sends the object name together with a request and you can't modify it also in the browser for security reasons. So what you need to do then is finally you need to do a listing of the container and to retrieve the final object name because otherwise it's not possible that you know it. And if your application refer does a reference uh, or holds a reference to this object, you need to know it somewhere. So it's probably a good idea to do this asynchronously. So after you upload an object, later on you just do a listing, a special listing uh, on the container and retrieve the object name. One thing here is Swift makes it possible to avoid direct uploads to the application itself. So if you, do an applica if, if you do an upload, upload it directly to Swift. Don't upload it to your application and the application then forwards it to, to Swift. Because if you do that, it gets, well, the scalability of your application is really uh, lowered in that case. Um, if you can upload the data directly to Swift, it's much easier for your application. Your application is much more lightweight because it only needs to handle metadata and small requests, and all the big requests go directly from the browser um, to, to Swift itself. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we wanted to talk about web applications and not uh, only Swift in the back end. Um, the simplest way to get started if you want to use Swift or in a development environment is an instance called Swift All-in-One. There is a documentation available on the OpenStack web page, but there are also various numbers of automated um, scripts using, for example, Vagrant uh, to, to make it even simpler for you. Uh, I have a few links at the end of this talk, and then you can fire up a VM with a completely running development environment uh, within Swift in a few minutes, which is a really great way to start, actually. By default, all uh, Swift all-in-one environments use uh, username of test tester and a password of testing. So, if you don't, do, if you use that one, um, all the examples that I will show you uh, soon uh, should be working fine. So, let's talk about first talk about uh, client-side applications with Angular and Swift. So, Angular is a web with a JavaScript framework. Um, that makes it very easy to start writing client-side applications. So the application itself is running inside your web browser. So there's no, normally no need, uh, at least not in the beginning, for a web server in this case. You can store the whole application, for example, on Swift itself. It runs directly off Swift, uh, served by Swift, uh, using a public available container. As I said, there's no application server needed in that case. Swift happily returns uh, JSON, for example, if you do a container listing, and that's directly usable uh, by Angular. You don't need to convert anything in that case, uh, which even simplifies the whole process a little bit more. And what I want to show you during this talk is to make container listings a little bit more powerful. So there is a middleware inside Swift that you can configure. It's called Static Web. If you remember the Apache directory listing that was invented probably 15 or 20 years ago, it's very similar to this. You have just a basic listing of the container content, making it downloadable. That's a great way actually to, to exchange data or large data sets with, for example, customers or clients. Um, for example, if you're a media company and want to 
ship uh, really large video files for your customers, you can use that. So I want to add a few more features to this. Uh, sorting one, uh, showing metadata, because you can show, um, access the metadata within Swift itself, and actually do some range requests. So range requests in HTTP is basically you have a large object, but you tell Swift or you tell your web browser to download only a part of that object. And if you have media files, that makes a lot of sense because very often in large media files, you have smaller embedded previews, for example. If you have um, um, a picture from a still camera uh, recorded in a so-called RAW format, you most of the time you have a small JPEG embedded that you could read. And I want to show you that. One thing we need to talk about is the cr cross-origin resource sharing. So, as I said earlier, it's normally not allowed uh, for scripts within running in your browser to access data from a different domain. And uh, that's uh, where the cross-origin resource sharing comes into play. So, the simplest workaround is actually to, if you want to just start with Swift and Angular, uh, to upload your data to a public container on Swift itself, because then it runs on the same domain. But uh, that might not be um, the best way in the long run, so you probably run your application code from one server and uh, running Swift on a different server or domain. But happily, it's quite easy. You just set a special metadata on the container, and then it is possible to retrieve the container data within your application. So that's some HTML code, and it's a full HTML code for the first example. It's not that much. You can already see there are some directives that are not, uh, well, HTML5 code, but that are related to Angular. Uh, you start with an ng app, uh, which tells uh, basically Angular what application is running there. You have two included files, one for Angular itself, one the JavaScript that is running uh, for your application. And then what you can see in line number eight, you do some repeat. Some so you have a listing of objects finally there. And for each found object in that listing, you want to print out a table line uh, in your HTML code or in your browser. The corresponding JavaScript code, uh, it's also the full example in this case. So you have a controller. Angular has a controller. You have an URL and you have a header. And what you're doing is, um, line number four, is you do an HTTP GET. So if you do an HTTP GET on a Swift public container, you retrieve a JSON listing of all the objects that are stored inside the container. And if you get, if that was successfully, you use the res returned response data, assign it to a variable, in this case objects, that was a variable num uh, before uh, in the HTML code, and it gets iterated over it. If it fails, then you just lock the uh, content, in this case, to the JavaScript console. <coughs> so let's have a look what happens in reality if I execute that one in my browser. So this is a, I make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, that should be fine. This is a public container directly served by Swift, and it executes directly the file example number one, HTML, and this one directly lists the content of, of my Swift, um, Swift container in this case. That's not very spectacular, I agreed. Um, uh, so maybe we make it a little bit more useful. I talked about metadata before. So each of the objects that you can see here um, has some metadata applied to it. There are some default metadata in Swift and some other metadata that you can configure or set on your own. So let's call the second example. And these directed, there are some, some new things here. So first, uh, now the, the whole content becomes uh, sortable. So if I want to know uh, what's the biggest object, I just click on size. And Angular is, is then doing the sorting uh, of all the stuff, and uh, I can find the, the biggest or the smallest object. But there also is there's also a link at the end uh, of each line. And for example, if I click on this one, 
the Angular uh, application does a head request now onto this object and retrieves some data that is stored on with this object. And uh, there are some, some metadata that I set. Um, in that case, it's always prefixed with X object meta. And there's one in the first line. There's the X object meta preview length. And there's one in, the, in that line here, X object meta preview start. And as I told you earlier, some media files have embedded previews. So I make use of that uh, in the next example. So what I'm doing now is I'm adding a little bit more CSS stuff to make it a little bit more pretty and make use of the embedded metadata. So the only thing that I change now is I used uh, the very familiar um, bootstra bootstrap CSS environment to make it a little bit more pretty for you um, and added a preview setting. So if, I, for example, as I said, we have a preview length in the second line and we have a preview start, that's an offset within the whole object. As you can see, the whole object is around 8 megabytes in size. And if I just click here, oh, that works nice. Um, it only retrieves a few hundred kilobytes, the embedded preview in this case. And that's much more useful than a normal static listing, right? So if you're a media company, um, you could, for example, you could, of course, extend it a lot more. But this is an application that is really running using only Swift. There is no other server needed. And um, I think it's a good way to start, actually, with Swift. Any questions so far? Everybody's wondering what's, what's happening here. OK. <laughs> so if you want to go a little bit uh, further, uh, then you probably want to add um, some, some database stuff or similar things, because now we are only, uh, we are limited. Yeah, there's a question. OK. So the question was um, to, to see the actual request that is sent. Um, Let's do that in Chrome because it has a nice built-in. So let's go to the one. Is that big enough? Okay. So if I just do the listing, uh, the object listing, um, you see some some smaller requests here at the top uh, at the bottom. Um, Basically, the one in, in the um, in the last line, the last two lines, and if I do the preview request, let's see where it is. That one, uh, the second line from the bottom. There is a request, and as you key, as you can see at the end, the size of this preview is like 580 kilobytes uh, uh, totally. And the original obje object was 8.2 megabytes. So uh, the headers. Uh, there, this is a, the headers. Why, why do you want to see the? So there are no special headers set uh, sent with this request. It's just a basic get request. Oh, you want to see the content length and content range stuff that I sent along with the request. Okay, so I can show you directly what's happening in the. Uh, in the source code. Sorry? E yes, uh, but I just want to show directly what, what I'm doing in the source code. Uh, let's see. So the question was, what, what did I send along with the request as a headers? How did I get the request? What I'm doing here is I do an HTTP head request, and then, one second, I retrieve the headers that I stored previously on the uh, together with the object. That's the first uh, task, and the second one is it should be yeah. The actual loading of the image happens here in this case in the in the first 15 lines or so. And in line number two, I send uh, the range that I want to uh, retrieve from this object. 
So I give it a start and an end uh, point, and then it get, uh, gets retrieved uh, by the browser. All right. So we don't have that much time, so I switch over to Django now. Um, if there are no more questions, otherwise ask me afterwards. There is one question. Yes, uh, so uh, the, the comment was that Swift, Swift itself can be used as a web server. That's true, um, as long as you have static content or content that is uh, executed on the browser side. So in that case, uh, you can use Swift itself uh, to store content directly without the need for another web server. Yeah, thanks. So sometimes it's uh, required that you do some post-processing, uh, for example, um, of your objects, of your data that you uploaded, um, or some pre-processing, whatever. In that case, you need to do it normally on the server side. So you build a server side application. Uh, one very popular framework, um, because we are doing a lot of Python stuff here in OpenStack, is uh, then uh, Django. Django is around since, I don't know, um, a few years already. Um, it's a very popular project, and um, I really like it, so I'm talking about that. If you're new to Django, there's a very good uh, tutorial on the Django project website, and um, that gives you a basic introduction on how to build a basic web application using Django itself. And for the examples, in this case, I'm using the two of the middlewares that are shipped with Swift, so temp URL and form post. As I said earlier, with these, you can make it possible uh, to download directly data, download and upload data directly from the browser to OpenStack Swift without the interaction of the application. The application only creates the, pre, uh, the uh, URL, uh, signed URL in that case, and returns that URL to the client, and the client can make use of that. So there's no need to route the, all of the data through the application itself. So. For a simple example, uh, we have, or I have, a simple file sharing application. So maybe your manager comes to you tomorrow and says, well, we have a nice Swift cluster in our data center. I want to have a way to share temporary data with our customers or clients, and uh, it should have a nice URL, and it shouldn't live on your public cloud, uh, cloud provider. It should uh, live on our own instance of Swift. So for that, in Django, you normally have views. So um, if you access a URL in your browser, a special view is executed. And this example makes use of three different views. I have one for uploading data. It basically um, creates a signature and a form that is shown uh, within the browser. I have a second uh, view that is executed after the upload. So after the upload, Swift redirects the user, or can redirect the user, to a new or different URL. And this finalized um, view updates uh, the entry within the database application. And of course, I want to have a download view. So how does it look like? If you're, uh, just a short remark here, if you're developing within, uh, using Python, uh, it's probably the best idea to start with Python Swift Client because it makes it much easier to, to start with and um, it's, it's actually very simple. The first operation is you get an authentication token and a storage URL and using that storage URL and authentication token, you can do all of the um, all of the requests to Swift itself without caring for the REST API itself. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, for example, reading metadata or list, uh, the list of containers and objects, storing new uh, metadata and so on and so forth. And these comments are then used in this example. Um, yeah. So the temporary URL key. So if you want to create a signed URL you need a temporary URL key that is stored within Swift itself, normally on the account level. With uh, more recent uh, Swift versions, you can do that also per, account, per container level. So this view or this uh, helper function basically tries to retrieve the, that key. And if that key is not available, it uses a Swift client to actually create a random one and to do a post request on the account level to store a new key. The value of the temporary key 
and the storage URL is then used, for example, in the download view. So that's a, the whole download view. The first or the second line actually is a request to to a Django model or Django object, which is stored within your database. So you request a URL, for example, with a primary key of, let's say, one, and then you have a table in your database, and uh, if it finds it, um, you know the container name and the object name, hopefully, afterwards. Then you set an expiration time. In this case, it's only 60 seconds. That should be plenty of time for, for the request itself. But it requires that you are, that the server that is computing the signature and the time on the Swift cluster is more or less identical. If they are, of course, uh, different uh, by more than 60 seconds, it won't work. Uh, so make sure you're using NTP everywhere. Finally, you have a signature. And this signature is appended to a specifically crafted URL. So I have, at the end, an URL that includes container and account and object name, and appended are a few parameters. And this URL is then valid for, this, for the given time that you set in the expiration time. The upload part looks very similar. I won't go into the Python details for the upload part because it's also creating just a signature, basically. Um, more interesting is maybe here the HTML form. So that's an HTML form for a phone post request. You see some hidden fields here. Uh, the most prominent one is probably the signature field. There is a previously computed signature stored in it. And then you have a file upload field and you have a also a redirect field. So the redirect field gets um, populated with, well, the next URL that should be executed after the upload has finished. So, after the upload is done, we're going to the redirect URL, and then for all the objects that we found that are stored uh, on your Swift cluster, um, it does a listing of them in the, in the container where you uploaded the data to. And if it finds an entry, it saves it in the database. Do you see any problems here? Clay should see a problem. Oh, no. <laughs> so I told, uh, told you earlier about the eventual consistency. If one of the database, if one of the parts of Swift itself is maybe down or it's overloaded at the moment, you upload an, an object to Swift, but the listing of the objects in this container might not yet be updated a few seconds later. So if you do this one, which gets executed directly after the upload, it might not find an actual object yet because the listing is not yet updated. So it's probably a very good idea to do that in an asynchronous uh, process later on. For example, you could trigger an action here saying, OK, that, that upload should be finished right now. Please check that. And if you don't find anything right now, do that later, like five minutes later or 60 seconds later or whenever. And you need to be aware that this can take a, take a lot of time. So the default time for a valid upload request within Swift is 24 hours. So if you start as a client to upload a new object to Swift and you upload, for example, only one byte per second, then it will take a lot of time until you're done. And you need to take into account this amount of time if you want to do the asynchronous listing of the objects. Because if you start right now, and the client is very slowly, and you look at the list of objects right in five minutes, for example, might still not be there. So you need to be aware of that. OK, so let's have a look um, what happens in reality with Django. So that's, uh, one second, need to start the Django. Yeah. So Django has a build and development server. And if I start that one, it listens on your local host. And the simple example that I showed you before uh, on the slides just uh, presents you a basic form for uploading data. So, where is so I select my talk slides. I do an upload. So it was very quick. It's only two megabytes or one megabyte in the Swift uh, cluster running locally. What, is, what happened here in, the, in between is 
The upload was directly sent to Swift. The upload finished. Swift redirected the user to a new URL. Um, there are some finalize in it, uh, then a r more or less random prefix because I prefixed the object. And this finalized view then created the database entry in inside your Django application. So if I click that link, um, then it will open a download preview or a download uh, starting with my summit talk PDF. So I don't get the a six as a name or whatever. Um, the Django application forwards the re or redirects the request directly to Swift using the signed URL that I created before and um, Swift gives you the possibility to save that object. So you have some nice URLs uh, only with a D and a 6 at the end um, that should be much uh, simpler to read for your customers, clients, whoever, or your manager. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a basic example in this case. So I need to come to an end, I think. So a few notes uh, from my side. Don't store millions of objects per single container. That's probably a bad idea if you're not using SSDs inside your Swift cluster um, because it might get a little bit more slow. Um, the requests if you do, for example, storing new objects. Um, if you're in charge of the application itself, you, it should be fine to to distribute data across multiple containers without any problems. Don't mimic any renames. Uh, so there is a copy and a delete uh, possibility within Swift, but don't do that to, re to mimic the rename behavior because actually you're moving data inside the Swift cluster. That's fine if you do that for one object. That's going to be a problem if you do that in a short time for a million objects. Keep the eventual consistency in mind, as I said earlier. So container listings might not be updated yet. And also, if you use TempUL and FormPost, check the metadata that is stored with your object. A user might, or a bad user might intercept, uh, might use that one and store his own metadata along with this request. And there are some special metadata called, for example, xdeleteAd, which is for an expiring object. And if you set that, for example, to one day, then Swift will delete this object after one day, but you still have a reference in your application database because the application database is not aware of that. So after the upload, check the metadata of that object to make sure that uh, users don't fool you in that case, or bad users. Normal users won't do that. That said, I have a few references. The first one is a small repository with the examples from this talk um, that you might want to look into. Um, just ping me if you have any questions on that. And also all the um, interesting slides and documentation from the Swift and other projects as well. And if you want to have a look into developing your middlewares, there was a talk one and a half years ago. Um, maybe or hopefully that's also useful for you. Have a look at that too. And that said, I'm done. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this talk. <laughs>